right here. Um, having said that, welcome to everybody, to all of you, 100%. Uh, it's, it's great to see you all. Uh, Sister Leah, I, I listened to her. She spoke of her mom coming out to visit with her. Uh, in pre-meeting, we were having some conversations, and I heard her speaking about her mom coming over um, across, the, across the ocean to visit with her, and that was wonderful. But when Sister Leah is with us, we become an international group. And when the rest of you are here, we are most certainly a national um, congregation. And so welcome to the Church of Jesus Christ with no other designation. And I say that be <clears throat> because we are an international group. Locally, we're very, very small today. And um, online, we're very large. And so it's nice to see everybody out there. And we appreciate you guys being with us and pray that the Lord blesses you. That's where my thoughts are. That's where my heart's at. And I, I pray that this message is is from God. And, and I will, um, while I've introduced you to the Church of Jesus Christ with no um, localized um, attachment. Um, our theme today will identify quickly that we are a, a mission in the South. Our theme today is I'm fixing to improve. I'm fixing to improve. Now the word fixing is, um, is a term that's used uh, all the time in the South. Fixing means I'm preparing for, I'm getting ready to, I'm fixing to improve. And yet uh, my play on words is incorrect and that's not what fixing means at all. What fixing means has nothing to do with the South. It means literally, I'm fixing. I'm fixing myself. I'm fixing what's broken. I'm fixing to improve. There's a great quote that I've, I've had in my heart forever, uh, probably at least since I, I read um, some of my first self-help books in the 1980s. Uh, the author was Leo Bascalia, who taught a course on Love 101 in Southern California on a college campus. And he had a quote that said, growth is the only evidence of life. Growth is the only evidence of life. I watched something on television last night, this wonderful um, documentary with a counselor uh, and his patient, I would say, um, a famous patient. And I'm not go going to do a commercial for this uh, uh, at all. I, I'm just telling you, I watched this last night. And it was about the fact that the patient was healing. <laughs> Um, he was through this counseling, he was getting feeling better and and feeling himself improving, feeling himself going in a direction that was healthy and uh, wanted to bring his um, his therapist on in, in this documentary that we might be be helped in some way or at least give us some direction. And it was confirmation to the message I already had. I thought, oh, this is so good. So I, I'm, I'm not certain that um, my confirmations always come from, uh, from television, but it happened last night and it made me really, really uh, pleased to get that type of confirm. And I, I hope it is exactly what um, God intends. I constantly share a verse with you all. Um, some would say it's probably one of my favorites of, of all time, and it probably is. And it um, comes from 2 Nephi, the, the second chapter. I believe it's the 25th verse, and it says men are that they might have joy. Now, I say that quickly because I say it all the time, and I don't want anyone to say, oh, we're going to get a redo of all his other sermons. Not at all. But I want to say that to you, that our purpose in this life is to be joy-filled. And I would, I would counter that with, so that must mean that we are all joy-filled. That's the intention, and it just happens as a gift from God, and joy is a gift. It is part of the many gifts that are offered to us. Uh, but if, if it were so, then we should all be at joy to fullness. And I would guess we're not. I would challenge that we are probably not at that point. Um, I don't mean to exhaust um, something that Sister Patty said on Tuesday or, or a couple of weeks ago, um, but it was so... Um, it was so wise. And she talked about us, um, and again, I'm, I'm giving a, a, an overview of what she said. So Sister Patty, if I don't get it completely right, I'm not quoting you, I'm only recalling. 
um, so that I don't get in trouble with anyone. But our, our sister, uh, in a moment of explanation, said, uh, we are, in essence, she said, we are a composite of all our experiences, is what she was saying. And so uh, we can't necessarily identify the source of any behavior in a moment based on one thing, but instead on many things, our upbringings, who we are, where we come from, uh, our different experiences we have. And that's what I'm saying today. And that's what I'm saying um, attacks our joy. Again, uh, those, those phrases that I use and overuse uh, play into this message again. Uh, the, the fight between the natural man and the spiritual man are constant in our lives. This is why any victory that we enjoy, any victory that we enjoy is all honor and glory to God. Because given our own devices, given on our own, we fail. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I, I hope that everyone agrees with me. Um, I hope that everyone agrees with me just because I'm probably, um, I want to be right. <laughs> and so I, I hope when I say man is built to fail, you lean in with me. Now, you may, you may resist that phrase at first, and I understand that. No one wants to hear such negativity, but it's not. And it's not intended to be negative. But if man is truly, as I say, built to fail, then any success goes to the glory of God, because I also believe that God intends us to succeed, but only through Jesus Christ. So it's really a good thing when I say to you, you're built to fail. You should say, well, thank you, brother. I feel so much better about myself because when you embrace Jesus Christ, then the success of, of, of his overcoming plays in and all honor and all glory goes to him. So when I say that we're intended to be joy filled, it's a good statement. It just doesn't happen for most people. And it has to be something extraordinary. And so. I'm fixing to improve plays into every facet of your life. We are born innocent. We're born pure. We're born, born perfect. And then it seems that life does all that it can to take us down. Life is hard. And life's difficulties leave fingerprints all over our souls, all over our spirits, all over our minds all over us. And so many are broken badly. M most are broken normally, and all are broken in some way or another. So having said that, it's a pretty good message, I would say. <laughs> but again, that's why the infusion of Jesus Christ, the rescue of Jesus Christ is necessary. Sometimes it comes on one's own. So sometimes it's just our wisdom and we decide that, that we're going to make changes, corrections, which is why the show that I watched last night was so glorious that, that this is a person who is uh, taking action to feel good, to feel better. The sad part of it is, is it was single faceted. The focus was only one sided. Um, and maybe there was a spiritual base by way of um, centering oneself, but I did not hear a direction to Jesus Christ at all. And I'm not finding fault with this. I'm not critiquing it. I'm just saying it was limited in, in the rescue. The full rescue comes from Jesus Christ. Um, but we have a responsibility to fix ourselves and turn ourselves over to the Lord. We are called to something grander than whatever we've gotten ourselves into in life. I hope you understand that. Again, not a critique, just an observation and just a solution uh, being brought to you today. And that solution becomes by every one of us saying the same thing. I'm fixing, not fixing, or you'll get confused with the, the theme. I'm fixing myself. I'm fixing to improve. What improvement are, are we looking for? Uh, Jesus Christ says it this way, be ye perfect, even as my father is. Now that's a pretty lofty goal. We get that. That's a pretty high standard. In fact, if, if most would agree that if perfection is where you set your goal, everything will disappoint. And so I, I, get, I get that theory. 
And so um, instead, uh, we, we work on just improving slowly small places so we, we find some successes along the way as, as we work to improve ourselves. Um, but again, I'm going to stay with that word, perfection. I'm going to keep that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to take that down and, and I'm going to report that to you. But Jesus Christ says in his sermon on the Mount, be ye perfect. Now, maybe the word perfect there has a different definition than we might be hearing when we hear that immediately, because I, I really do believe in um, this perfection that he speaks of. And I think it, again, only comes from Jesus Christ. Paul repeats it, and we hear perfect and perfection throughout. Uh, in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, um, Paul writes about different offices, different ordinations, different ordinances, different means in which we can improve ourselves and be improved by others. And he says, all of this is given, quote unquote, for the perfecting of the saints. Again, perfection. We want to get to a place where we can fully realize our intended status. Men are that they might have joy. Joy comes from that victory, from that success, from Jesus Christ overcoming whatever it is that holds you down. And I think anyone who has had any issues with um, any kind of setback understand the joy of overcoming. So having said that, we are intended for some joy out there that only comes through Jesus Christ. But I would say comes by way of your efforts to connect with Jesus Christ, to break away from what you're doing naturally. And so you have a responsibility. There is a last scene in, in a movie called The Last Samurai. And if you haven't seen it, and I'm, I'm going to tell you this is a spoiler alert, um, my family tells me to stop talking about movies all the time because I spoil the endings all the time. But I'll just say this. If you haven't seen this movie 20, for 20 years, shame on you because you miss you. It's your fault that you don't know this movie. So it, at the end of this, what it's about is it's about a Western soldier warrior. And Tom Cruise is playing this role. Uh, this Western warrior goes to the east and goes to the direction under a samurai under the, the, those who believe that um, war is an honor and that there is an honorable way to battle against. Um, uh, we had a, a coach that, that interact, he and I interact a lot and we both read the same book, The Art of War. And again, it's a, a philosophy of face-to-face, of -face, head head-to-head battling with one. I love this book on a spiritual sense. Because we are in constant battle with, with the evil one. And so there is a way of doing this from a spiritual point of view. And that's what this movie is about. He's trying to train this Western warrior in ways that are spiritual. And um, as, as a battle has um, come to a conclusion, and the two great warriors, one from the West, one from the East, one from the Americas, one from Asia, are laying out in this field. And one is, is, one is watching or feeling their life come to an end. Um, as they sit there, um, they're, they're surrounded by trees, they're surrounded by these beautiful, I believe they were cherry blossoms, and they're, they're floating in the air by them. And the um, samurai says to the other warrior, as he catches them, I believe in his hand, he says to him, they're all. And I've always believed that's how the Lord looks at us. When he looks down from his throne and sees us down here, he sees us in our perfection, in our intended joy, in where he wants us to get to. And he whispers to his son, they're all perfect. And so that's our quest. Our quest is to fix what's broken and improve, not with blame to parents, not with blame to experiences, not with blame to your own choices, Regrets will, will just take you under. And, and Candace and I constantly have conversations where we battle regrets. And there's nothing you can do to change the past. There's everything you can do to change your future. And it's embracing Jesus Christ and embracing 
fixing what's broken. There's a beautiful relationship. Um, and your homework assignment this week is um, the entire book of 2 Timothy. Please read this. And I, ju I just want to say to you, many of you read um, uh, on, a, on a, probably a daily basis and read novels or read uh, nonfiction or, or read the, the, the news on, online. I was going to say a newspaper. I don't think they exist anymore. But many of you read and take in information. And that's, don't stop doing that. I'm not here to change any of that. But I want to say to you, not out of responsibility, not because you have to, but instead because you want to and you get to, read the Word of God and read it to fix. Read it to improve. Read it because you have a burning desire to find, as the Word says, what's delicious in it. I think you're going to find Second Nephi, all four chapters, four chapters, four, four chapters, of, excuse me, Second Timothy. Um, you're going to find 2 Timothy delicious. And what it is is, and if you do, go back and read 1 Timothy too, because it's good. But it's a prep for 2 Timothy. I'm sorry, I keep saying that. 2 Timothy is, is a letter from an old man to a young man. 2 Timothy is a correspondence from a mentor to his student. Second Timothy is a, a, a letter of instruction written to someone so that they miss the speed bumps that the older man hit. Here's where the potholes are. Here's where the speed bumps are. Don't hit those. I'm giving you counsel. Listen to what I'm telling you. And young people normally will say, that's okay. And we, we don't always listen. Um, I, I remember we had this wise person in our lives and um, she often gave wonderful counsel. Her counsel wasn't always, um, it wasn't always packaged well. And so as young people, we resisted, Candace and I resisted this wonderful counsel from this person and they were frustrated. And most of the frustration began with you young people today, <laughs> you young people today, and then we'd get here the correction. And what what um, neither of us understood is first the the presentation was poor from this wise individual, um, and our hearts were rebellious. And so that's a pretty bigness on both sides. Um, this is neither. This is a a letter, uh, a correspondence of love that's packaged well. And so whether you're a young 20-something um, or a young 30-something or a young 60-something, this chapter, uh, this book is, is perfection. And I think that you'll find it um, enriching to you. So please, your homework assignment is 2 Timothy, all four chapters. Now I'm going to tell you something else. It's filled with highlight verses. But I'm going to give you some context this morning to those verses, not just read them as standout verses, and they are standout verses, but I'm going to read them to you in, in the intended flow that they have through these four chapters, so you understand why they came. You'll hear, stir up the gift. Everyone knows that verse. Stir up the gift that's within you. Oh, what a great verse, and that's a standalone verse. Build a sermon around that one. But it also is part of four chapters of counsel, and it falls perfectly in place where it's found in the in Second Timothy. So I, that's how I'm going to go through these chapters this, this morning, just a verse or two, but show you how it evolves and how this counsel is to this young man, Timothy, from Paul. Paul, who was such a vicious warrior. Uh, as, as we reference this other movie, it's probably uh, very similar. The, the, uh, Paul is a samurai, and um, Timothy is probably the young warrior being trained. But in this case, we get the fully evolved samurai when we're, when we're seeing Paul, because Paul started off as, as so vicious, but focused 
He felt he was right. And so he had a cause to stop this church, this, this blossoming church under the, the direction of this new voice, Jesus Christ. We've got to stop all that they're doing out there because they're destroying religion and they're destroying what we have as a tenants for religion here in, in this part of the world. And so Paul was a, on, a, on a mission to destroy only to be stopped in his tracks by God, by the power of God, and his life turned completely. We find this man who is, um, as Sister Patty says, is damaged by upbringing, is damaged by, by whatever else experience he had, and now he's healing through all of his experiences. That's the Paul that we have as the writer who is is understanding his mistakes, understanding his missteps. I am the worst of all sinners, he calls himself. And that's because he doesn't see himself in present form. He, he does what all of us do. Paul always looks back and sees the sins of the past and brings those forward. And that's what he carries forward. And so now he's taking all that and saying, Timothy, don't make the mistakes I made. In the first chapter, we're going to go right to the stir up. He, he starts by telling him about himself. Um, these are the things that I did. And then he says um, within his speaking, wherefore I put thee in the first chapter, the sixth verse, wherefore I put thee in remembrance. I want you to recall this moment in remembrance that, that you stir up the gift of God, which is in thee. Watch what Paul says, by the putting on of my hands. And what he's saying is, Timothy, you cannot deny the moment we had. I'm the one who laid my hands on your head. I'm the one who called for the gift of the, the Holy Ghost to fall on you and, and encompass you. I was there. Go back to that point, Timothy, because we're going to start moving forward. And I want this to be your first reference, that you know, no matter what you say, no matter who you say you are, no matter where you say you've walked, I was there the day everything changed. I want you to remember that. I want that to stir up something in you. For God hath not given us, and I rewrote this verse, confession. I rewrote this verse, and I'll tell you where I rewrote it so that it has more impact to you. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. I've always heard that as a spirit of fear. He says, he's talking about the spirit of God to Timothy. I laid my hands on you, and that spirit is not the spirit of fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear. He goes on to say, but of power. I'm going to put the spirit in front of all of these words so that we understand how powerful this statement is. I'm going to reread it. Thou hast not, or excuse me, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power, and the spirit of love, and the spirit of a sound mind. That's the Holy Ghost that, that inhabits you now. Therefore, be thou not ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. You have this spirit in you. Now use it. You have all that you need. Now use it. You want joy in your life? Fulfill God's intention for you. That's what Paul's saying to, to Timothy. That's where two great verses come in. The one about the spirit, for, for we don't have a spirit of uh, fear, we have a spirit of power. And he also goes on to say, don't be ashamed of your testimony of the Lord in your life. For this cause, I also suffered these things. Nevertheless, he goes on to say, this is in 12 and 13, I am not ashamed. This is what Paul says. I am not ashamed, for I know who I have believed, and am persuaded that he, Jesus Christ, this, this gift within me, he is able to keep that which I've committed. I've committed myself to Jesus Christ. He will help keep me in place. I am not ashamed for I know who I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day, that day of temptation, that day that someone pushes against me. I can push through this if I walk into it with the power, with the spirit of power. Hold fast, he says, the form of sound words. Don't let silliness, don't let the, the chirping of other people work against you. He says, hold fast the sound of the sound words 
which you have heard in me. Now Paul's saying, I'm your mentor. Don't let anyone talk you out of. Don't let any situation cause you to pause. Don't be stirred. Don't be taken off track. Don't fall off the path. That's the first chapter. He goes on into the second chapter. And this is where this great verse comes. I'm just lifting this one out, out of context because it flows. And I want you to hear this. He's telling him, go into the word of God. Read. Now you've heard what I've, I've talked to you about. You have the power of God within you. Now also study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman. Each of you work, workmen for the Lord. A workman that needs not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. What that means is you have the ability, you have God's spirit within you to discern and decide what's good and what's bad for you. Improve. Fix yourself. Rightly divide good from evil and choose good. For the perfecting of the saints is what Paul's saying to Timothy. You have all that you need to find perfection in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm fixing so that I might improve. I'm fixing to improve. Or if you're in Kentucky, I'm fixing to improve. That's our theme today. Second Timothy, the third chapter. All the third chapter. Read it. All the third chapter. I want you to read this chapter. He starts by saying, you're going to be met with people who are convincing, but do not carry the right spirit. We see this happening in 2022, left and right. We see it happening anywhere, everywhere. People who are leading and people whose voices are louder than other voices who are saying things, and we're just nodding. Believing, because they speak with authority, believing them. He's saying, don't fall prey to trickery. And I'm not going to read them all because I don't want anyone. I, I want you to discover the first few verses and what these are. Um, individuals that, that we all will come against. Remember what he said before. You have the ability to divide right from wrong. You have the ability to discern good from evil. Stir up the gift that I placed in you as a, as a minister, having the authority. Remember that moment, he said. Verse 10 says this, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life. I don't ever remember reading that in this verse. My manner of life, he says. My purpose, my faith, my long suffering, my charity, my patience the persecutions and afflictions which came unto me. He's not bragging. Paul is not saying, look at me. He's saying to Timothy, you are an eyewitness to all that I went through. You know who I am. You've seen me at my lowest. You've seen me at my best. And when I was at my best, it was under the influence of God. When it was at my lowest, it was under the influence of my own spirit, my own guide. You know the difference he's saying to Timothy. You, you eyewitnessed all of this. Goes on to say in the end of the third chapter, and this is our conclusion to the scripture. In 15, he says this, and I'm jumping, so you have to fill in with your homework this week and read back, but, but I want you to do that. He says to Timothy, from a child, he says, thou, I'm going to say you, I'm going to make a few um, changes so that we can speak in, in today's word. And that from a child, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise. Listen to this, unto salvation through faith. You know the word. I've asked you to read this week. I've asked you to dive into the word of God. I've asked you to improve to fix what's broken by using the word. And he's saying to Timothy, you know the word. Since you were a child, you were raised on this. You were weaned on the word. Even to a point that you're able to be wise enough to choose salvation through your faith. Still discerning. 
And he says, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given. Again, another verse that is pulled out of context and we use it, but this is the context that it was meant. You have, you have your foundation in the word and then he confirms it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for improvement, for fixing oneself, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And righteousness gets a bad rap. Righteousness often is, is said with sternness and a finger pointing. And righteousness, I think I've done enough Tuesday night seminars. I think I've made it my case strong enough, but I'm going to say it out loud um, so that we remember what I believe righteousness to be and nothing more. Righteousness is pure love. Love God. Truly, if you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your spirit, with all your mind, with all your strength, I ask you this, where is there room for sin? And then Jesus Christ says, love others with this same vigor as you love yourself. And I say this, where is there room for sin? If you truly love God, if you truly love others, if you truly love self in, self in a healthy way, where is there room for anything but righteous, pure love? No, no ability to sin. And so we are driven to purity out of love. Be perfect is a subset of perfect love for God for others, watch this, and for self. That the man of God may be thoroughly furnished, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You have, what Paul is saying is, you have all that it takes to fulfill joy. You have all that it takes to fulfill love. You have all that it takes to fulfill the improvement that I intend for you. But you got to fix. You got to improve. You got to want. You've got to desire and you've got to follow through. Maybe you're stranded somewhere in your life. Maybe you're stranded in blame. It's his fault. It's her fault. My father didn't love me enough. My mother was too hard on me. All of the above might be right, by the way. Check them all. Check all the boxes off. Whatever you need to do to justify where you are now, check all those boxes off. I have no argument with you. Okay, now we've made that case. Now where do we go? Let's fix ourselves. Now, where do we go? Let's improve on all of those things that you just spoke to. Let's find our intended joy. Because when we find that, we get that much more useful to God's purposes in our lives. We get that much more appropriate as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Our intentions are not just for soul salvation. Our first intention, our primary intention, is our own soul salvation. When we accomplish that, when we find Jesus Christ and he finds us, after that point, everything is about everybody else. Love others as yourself. I loved me enough. I loved me enough to follow Anthony Brooks into a dirty lake and get baptized as a young person. I loved me enough. I made an assessment of me and found myself wanting, found myself lacking, found myself a mess. And I said, I can't keep going this direction. That particular week, I've said this in my testimony so often, that particular week, my single intention was not to be baptized. 
I've been in one of these camps, these entrapment camps where they catch you in the spirit and they drag you up front and you start giving your testimony. And the next thing you know, you say, I want to be baptized. I want to be baptized. And so you're caught in so something has happened to me. I've been overcome by something and I'm saying things I, I didn't want to say. And that was me. Monday night at a camp. I didn't even last till Monday. I mean, till Tuesday. A Monday night at a camp, I'm giving my testimony. And my real testimony is I don't remember walking up front. Yes, old age probably plays into it. But I, even when I was 30, I couldn't remember this part of my testimony. Didn't remember. Spirit of God overcame me. I had told so many people, I'm not getting baptized. I'm not getting baptized here. I'm just here to see you all. I'm just here to have fun. And I was captured. Because in my moment of clarity, I knew I was mistake ridden. I knew I had failed in so much. And I wanted to start over. Hit the reset button. And so I did. And once I found that joy, like you, like anyone else who has made such a commitment, I want others to feel this. I want others to understand that they don't have to sit in their pain and their sin and their mistakes and their bad decisions and other bad decisions that have affected them. And so each of us are called to fix. Each of us are called to improve. Each of us are called to perfect. Each of us are called to love, to forgive, to be filled with grace and mercy, to draw all men and all women to Jesus Christ. But that's all it is. It seems so simple and it's so difficult. What's simple? is hate. What's simple is to resent. What's simple is to blame. What's simple is to spew in anger. What's hard is to love and forgive, just like Jesus Christ did for us. Might all of you leave from this place with one thought today at least. And it's this, I'm fixing to improve. May the Lord bless each one of you.